Um, so they're beautiful team. Thanks, guys. Collectively, we have over 200 years of experience dealing with environmental <laughs> <laughs> spaces. Um, let's be honest. They don't look good. They don't feel good. They don't sound good. They don't smell good. Um, I'm sure you guys have all dealt with that either personally, walking in their way to work. Maybe you go through an underpass. It doesn't look great. Feel safe. Um, you know, as a neighborhood, your property values can drop if there's a lot of that going on. Um, even as a city, we feel that if you're a city known for having lots of vacant lots, it doesn't uh, look too good or feel too good, right? Um, sorry. Oh, also, the, per the person we we're most interested in, the business improvement district. A lot of groups are already sort of dealing with this, right? But we know that it's a struggle. We've seen that not all business improvement districts can do it on their own. Um, and then again, on a personal level, uh, I want to say that I, even before I knew what a business improvement district was, um, in my freshman dorm, was not satisfied with, you know, the experience of the dorm is kind of not that great. And they started doing construction across the street that made it even more not great. It looked bad, it sounded bad, it smelled bad too. Um, I managed just from my own, you know, motivations to get a bunch of fabric donated and, like, wove it through the fence, which, you know, didn't help with everything, but at least it looked a little better. I definitely know, I wish I had had more help with that. Barack is going to help with other sort of I'm going to talk about two case, uh, case studies uh, concerning uh, business movement districts and the issues that they face. Uh, one issue, uh, uh, one case study and one tactic was done by the Columbus Circle Art Installation, where essentially the temp it was a temporary installation that provided a new experience for the city, but also raised funds to clean the statue when, when it was done. Literally, it was a scaffolding of a project that allowed for cleaning. So just to rephrase that, that was a case study done by an art project that was more than just art, but actually led to the cleaning of this particular space. Another case study that we've done, that we've seen uh, tackled by business improvement districts, particularly the Hudson Square bit, one of their primary issues is involving uh, traffic and the sound pollution that's caused by the Holland Tunnel. One of the tactics that they used to solve this solution was to implement PTMs, which are um, public uh, traffic managers, which essentially went out at key times when the traffic was most um, loud, and they really went out there to direct the cars and really evade the entire issue. Essentially, we're providing these case studies to prove that we, we have tons of experience in dealing with issues that fit space and... <laughs> so, what are we gonna offer? Um, we want to work collectively as a small group to identify neighborhoods and uh, bids that can use our help. Um, we want to build local teams um, that know the area, that know the neighborhood, that know what the business is already facing. Um, to provide olfactory, auditory, and visual improvements. Um, again, this is a, this is trying to be we're trying to be a full sensory experience, which is why uh, Panacea is our name. It's about a holistic solution to a problem that everyone's dealing with in the local environment. Um, I do know that there are lots of groups dealing with this. Even the Design Trust, for example, partnered with Architecture for Humanity to do a great installation under the BQE. Um, we're thinking that something like that is repeatable. If you can improve one section of the BQE. Why not do it all the way down? Why not use some sort of like new technology that we could, where did David go? We could come up with with David's great investment, um, you know, so that maybe instead of just a great picnic table and a gathering space, um, it also smells like the bakery that's down the road, you know, and then they would want to participate in that. Just to uh, jump to this uh, part to be clear what our service is, um, we are a team of consultants that means the panacea from every industry that our neighborhood addresses. So we're a team of consultants. Um, whenever we are approached by a an, an, uh, neighborhood, we make sure that we have on our team uh, representatives from every industry in the neighborhood that we address. Um, what's our product? Well, the panacea results in a temporary installation that results in a permanent remediation. So you're probably wondering who pays for that. Um, you heard that question before. So we're thinking again, local businesses might want to sponsor that. Um, Pedestrians, tenants, people who live and work in the neighborhood, they might even want to chip in $5. If you get 10,000 people to chip in $5, that's a lot of money. Um, also, I mean, I know a few construction firms who might want to make sure they stay on the neighborhood's good side. A lot of people don't like construction. If we could make it so that not only was the construction neutral, but actually an improvement, um, I bet a lot of people would feel good about that. Um, also, in the end, again, I'm hoping that this improves the over <laughs> overall community, maybe even improves property values. Um, the idea of improving property values during the improvement process is pretty great. Um, we're thinking long-term, 
You know, we could pilot this on the block level, but what if you could do this for an entire city? Um, what if you could do this for a whole state, even an island? Uh, it's pretty, pretty exciting. So again, we want to be local, we want to bring solutions, we want to be site specific, uh, we want to help everyone win, and we want to make sure that the human experience of neglected space can be better. Um, so our product is called Temporally, um, and basically um, we identified a market which was um, disaster relief. So um, it is a response to increasing focus in natural disasters. Our mission to provide customizable, deployable structures to disaster relief based on IKEA business model. So thinking through natural disasters that have taken place in the last five years, in response to Hurricane Katrina, um, the earthquake in Haiti, and the people that are affected by it, um, our populations are growing, and the climates are never the same within um, individual regions. So why would you send a FEMA trailer to an area like New Orleans? when you know these people are going to be able to have um, a structure that they need. We're going to customize that to the unique uh, region, the disasters that take place within that region, and based on this IKEA business model, not only will it be easily deployable, you'll be able to get it out fast, but the average person in the community can help you put it together. Um, so it'll be totally customizable. So how are we going to put this all together? You as the investor will invest in our business model about these deployable structures um, that are easy to put together. Governments, insurance agencies, they'll be the customers that, are, that will be funding money um, to purchase these products for the regions that are affected by the disasters. Um, our services that we're offering uh, are a lightweight, durable structure easily able to put together, modular. Um, you can be sure that it can be uh, sent by flatbed truck, or by ship, or by plane, anywhere you want. Um, how are you also going to fund this? By donations. You can get out your phone, and you know exactly where your money's going. You can be able to purchase the unique structure uh, you need to the region online. We'll have um, custom, uh, customizable models that you can just go online and um, check for the one that you're looking for and go purchase it and we'll send it to you deployed within 24 hours of the uh, natural disaster taking place. Okay. Basically, it's as simple as uh, click a button and you send, you know, we've got these cute parts that can be assembled in any any disaster stricken area and a very you know beautiful temporary housing to these people in their time of need. Ladies and gentlemen, today we have for you the big reveal. Remember to check shipment of feeding bubbles. <laughs>
It's raining. Where are you going to put all your people? New Grown Imagine. Create a temporary structure to protect you from the rain, and it's big enough, whatever size you need it to be, for your space. Emergency aid, disaster relief. Every day around the world, disasters happen, and you have nowhere of shipping your products. It costs money to ship products, to send people to the space. This little small cube, you send to the space, you open up, you have a space for your disaster relief. Education, schools in Africa. <laughs> so expensive to produce. Maybe I'm actually will make it possible for you. <laughs> Healthcare. Workspace. You don't have to share with your annoying neighbor. When you go imagine it, will open up a space for you alone to work in an area that you feel comfortable. If you want to work with other people, it's flexible. <laughs> Just tell us what you want to make for you. <laughs> Our services include planning, design, technological coordination. I know some of you are not so good with Facebook and Twitter, don't worry about it. We got you. <laughs> delivery. I mean, it's, it's in the palm of my hand, people. Come on, delivery. Value. What kinds can you put on our environment? The carbon footprint that it takes to ship wood from one side to another, to ship bamboo from some other companies to the U.S. I mean, it's there. We created it in the art of this. You should be able to place it on your site. It makes what you want it to be. Reduce carbon footprint. Speed and flexibility.
Um, and then say you have a firm like OMA and they're posting listings. You know, they have to go to their school chapters, they have their own website, they set up accounts on other websites. So considering AIA is the largest national body of architects, there's no reason why they can't um, make use of a social network that's somewhat based around them. So under this structure you have you know the one national AA network and then it branches off into the AA New York. And then any local member, whether it's Enya or AA chapter, would be affiliated to this or that. It's like very clear. And the idea would be to develop templates for what these green islands would be. And none of the islands would be isolated anymore. They'd all be linked within a framework. So example, like this event today, like I was promoted through my AIS chapter and I had to send out blast emails, text messages, flyers, I put it on the website, I to go and tell everybody. Or if you decide like this, you guys in the AI can just post it, and anyone who has a little green thread connected here will automatically get it. So you sign in, you see the New, uh, the New York page, and it's there. Uh, I don't know, something like that. Oh, <laughs> so currently what I'm doing is, I found this, the cool thing about social networking is you don't have to know a single line of code to actually make a website. I found this service where for, you know, for $20 a year, but for the lowest membership, I'm using $200. And I'm working on developing a template for just uh, this green little circle of like, what a student organization could be. So I'm running this now through my AIS chapter. And um, you know, we have forums on it, events. Um, yeah, forums are the biggest thing, because most websites are just an, you know, a blog telling you, you know, this is happening, then come here. But in this way, you can have all the students kind of uh, actually communicating, saying, you know, we need help with SketchUp. Can you guys put together a form and do that? So it's a new way of communication and what else? Calendar events. Calendar, stuff like that. And what I have to get out of this is any freshman coming through um, architecture school, right? They, in a sense, come through AIS and AIA and they're in contact with that. So if you make a service that you prove is invaluable to them and they can't go to school without having it, you're essentially going to have everybody, any architecture student as a freshman on here, and they'll all eventually become. AIA members, and you have a whole student architecture population in one centralized area, so it's like a clear way to reach them. Uh, any pursuit? Hi, I'm Ulysses, and this is Amir. And our company is Regen City. So, one of the biggest challenges in America today is to find out what to do with post industrialized cities that are dealing with urban decay. And our solution is by incorporating architects throughout the entire design process and trying to find that need in cities by uh, creating a value proposition of community revitalization and by providing uh, our services, which is proactive targeting, doing analysis, conducting a needs assessment in those cities, finding out what sites are underutilized, what buildings aren't used and have been abandoned, and then start local team development, getting local architects in to kind of help provide solutions for that city. And the effects by that is starting to increase monetary, aesthetic, and functional value so we have, that we can regenerate that city into something that's more sustainable and starts growing. And by doing that, uh, we can also empower the community by educating them and providing a set of tools to also kind of um, help them kind of improve the development stages. And we have this kind of loop in, in terms of showing that network. Um, oh my god, so many. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so, a part of the um, questions that we were asked during the development was how would this uh, be making money? Well, uh, a lot of companies, they go in and they target communities like this and they do it on a private basis for their own profit and they profit off the back of these communities. Maybe the communities do develop a little bit, but in, in general, these uh, these companies, they do it for their own profit. The idea behind our project is that we would uh, target these cities and we would make money with them, but they, we would also leave them with the ability to regenerate this process on their own once we're gone and we move on to another project. And another part of the income that we would make from this is on the salvage of uh, materials, uh, if we refurbish buildings, things like that. Uh, we provide local, ex uh, local expertise and uh, ways of, of targeting and choosing and doing and, and creating interesting designs that will help revitalize this community. And that's our project. So, issues that affect us all that we're really passionate about. 
is the fact that the housing market is not keeping up with the current trends of our culture. Um, and the, the fact that there are a lot of unused, un underutilized buildings and sites. Uh, our current population is growing and becoming more mobile, becoming more flexible and dynamic in what they're doing. So pop-up pods is our solution that addresses both of these two issues. Okay. So you can see right there, different pods for different, I'm not going to say it, possibilities. 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 <laughs> <laughs> we are a social responsible company. And, and we want to create mobile spaces that address affordability, flexibility, adaptiveness, and recyclableness. Uh, my name is Sean Boyd. And my name is Laura Metter. And we're going to change the way you think about housing, live in communities, respond to disaster relief, and plan your events all with one simple idea. Let's talk about the pods. <laughs> The way you work with the pod is very simple through an online app or maybe access to the internet. The thing that's most important to us is that it's accessible to anybody in any socioeconomic comment. Here's a basic design of our 12 by 12 by 12 basic 144 square feet, which is, you know, sprawling in New York, at the round price of 3000 which is extremely competitive to other, mod other modification buildings that we've checked out, such as the yurt, which just isn't really that great to live in the first place. <laughs> Here's a twin number two bed example, including a kitchenette, room dividers for privacy, table and chair, and additional doors at an additional price. <laughs> Again, different pods, different probabilities. This is one of our living designs, but things like this can actually be used for several things. We're thinking about the way they can be used through temporary housing, so for disaster relief, or for the student on the go who wants to go study abroad in Rome and doesn't want to pay for somewhere in college. Permanent housing for those who are looking to start a family and can't afford a home, who can? <laughs> disaster housing after a natural room disaster. Event space and exhibitions, um, because of the basic design of 12 by 12 by 12, they can actually be built up and created something. So if we want to uh, say during the Olympics, build several of them up, they can actually be both lodging and the stadium, which is actually very, very flexible and could uh, eliminate the idea that we build these huge spaces for events that happen once every four years and never get used again. And we can also have business and office space or other places, uh, such as medical offices and other things, because they are equipped with electrical and plumbing and deliverable. So let's talk about how we make this happen. Uh, we have a variety of partnerships and networking. And you can see here with our, with our chart, it's, it's, a, it's a great way for us to provide a service that we don't actually ship a physical thing from one point to another point. That we actually are partnering with our 3D printer. We actually received a wonderful grant by a 3D printer uh, company, we were very appreciative of that. <laughs> and so, we, obviously, the, the person on the other end, they, um, they look at the internet, they, they determine what they want, they have a great range of customization opportunities, and then we send them that information to the 3D printer that we have networked. There's also developers that we are networked with, a uh, partnership with uh, a lot of real estate brokers, lawyers, uh, People that, can, that we can actually bring together to, to find places where people want to live and want, like, where they want to work, that, that's part of a community that they can connect with already. Uh, we, as, as we were saying before, we feel like our, our biggest competition is the yurt, but it's, it's very obsolete. Uh, it requires a lot more things than, than uh, what we can offer in a better way. Uh, we want to end by saying, again, we're a social responsible company that we have a great passion for housing and for affordability, for bringing people together in wonderful community ways and connecting our communities and our cities. And um, in case you guys are wondering, we appreciate you so much for the best. It's actually our consent of 